Hi everybody, welcome all to this uh, virtual computational biology seminar uh, from SIB. Uh, today we have the pleasure to have uh, Jeffrey Jensen from the Population Genetics Group at the EPFL. So Jeff earned a Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Art uh, from the University of Arizona in 2002 uh, in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and Biological Anthropology. He earned then uh, his PhD in Molecular Biology and Genetics at uh, the Cornwall University in 2006. And um, then he moved on his postdoc work as the um, US uh, National Science Foundation Biological Informatics Fellow at uh, UC San Diego and uh, UC Berkeley. And then he founded his lab as an assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts Medical School in 2009. And he relocated his lab here at TPFL in 2011 and also became group leader at the CIP, the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. The group research focuses on statistical and computational aspects of evolutionary theory and population genetics. The lab members of uh, Jeffrey's lab uh, work on both applied and theoretical uh, problems in fields ranging from population genomics to medical genetics. Uh, the group has also developed several um, software tools. So uh, as you probably don't know, Jeff is going to relocate his lab back in the US at the Arizona State University uh, in the School of Life Science uh, and the Center for Evolution and Medicine in uh, 2017. So today, um, Jeffrey will share with us a few results of interest regarding the population genetics of creatures that live, live in humans. So Jeffrey, thank you again for accepting this invitation. And the floor is yours. Right, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I'll try and stay close to the, this microphone, I assume. Yeah, okay. Are people actually online? Do I need to do that? They're, they're really there? Okay, fine. <laughs> then, then I'll stay by the computer. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, thanks for coming. Feel free to interrupt for a relatively small-ish group, small enough to be interrupted with questions, I think. So let's just go along. I'm going to do three short stories today that are mainly just related by the fact that they're critters that live in humans. That's pretty much the unifying theme. So they're really three quite separate stories. We'll have natural um, stop points for questions as we go. Okay, so let me start with the basic notion that most of you are probably familiar or more than familiar, some of you, with the sort of generalities of human demographic history, um, by which I mean there were multiple movements out of Africa in the genus Homo. Um, modern humans certainly originated there, moved out various waves of migration. Um, we're attaching numbers to some of these things. These numbers over the last couple of years have been changing sort of rapidly with the advent of ancient DNA. So a lot of this history is being revised a bit, as I'll return to later. Um, but that's the general kind of picture. And this history of humans is characterized by recurrent events of population size change, population structure with migration, periods of uh, isolation, and followed by admixture, um, positive selection associated with the colonization of novel environments. We have um, at least a handful of pretty convincing examples in humans of this, whether it's uh, high altitude adaptation or lactase tolerance, etc. And of course, as with essentially uh, any population, pervasive purifying selection to get rid of, of deleterious things. So that's pretty much the story of humans. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, as I said, is the story of populations that live in humans. Um, and they're characterized, of course, by the same processes, mutation, migration, drift, and selection. Um, to varying degrees. And the three stories I'm going to tell you today are Helicobacter, Influenza virus, and Human Cytomegalovirus. Um, actually, not in that order, I know this now, um, confusingly, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so let's start with the short story in Helicobacter. So I'll start each of these little vignettes with just a little background on the critter. So um, Helicobacter is a bacterium. It infects mucosa of human stomachs outside of Africa. It's associated with some serious gastric pathologies, um, including cancer and ulcers. At least half of humans have it, um, almost certainly more than that. Almost all previous work, hey Roman, <laughs> come on in. Almost all previous work is focused on seven housekeeping genes. Um, recently, last year, this work led by um, a former EMBO fellow in the lab, Valeria, um, looked at this, we analyzed 60 whole genomes from globally distributed strains. 
um, to characterize patterns of local adaptation, the demographic history of, of helicobacter living in the human host. So let's just get to some quick results here. So the first observation of note is that there's lots of structure in helicobacter, by which I mean if you sample populations in South America, they're more alike than a South American population compared to an African population. Okay, that's probably not terribly surprising to you. Um, there's a number of groups. So there's at least two very distinct African groupings here shown in blue and black, and then there's a sort of North African European um, uh, Asian and Asian American, so it breaks up at k equals four, where these two things are grouped, and at k equals five, you get a distinct Native American grouping. Okay? Why this is interesting is the following. The estimated demographic history of Helicobacter itself really recapitulates the demographic history of humans. So you have this quite ancient split in Africa, you have a split off into the Middle East, a split off into East Asia, and a split off into the Americas. So this really supports the very ancient association with Helicobacter in humans, something that wasn't um, very widely appreciated, certainly before the SAM split. Um, and really intriguingly, as I'll return to in a minute, uh, Helicobacter itself is offering insights into human demographic history. And as I'll argue in a second, in a way that's often more insightful than you get from analyzing human samples. Okay, so let me just say a few words about selection. So now that we have a demographic model as a null, we can start asking what does local adaptation look like in Helicobacter. Um, the majority of evidence is for local adaptation, um, almost entirely in the African population, so the larger and more stable population, the more ancient population. Um, people are all excited in most organisms about the sort of out of Africa selection, colonizing all environments, but of course, from population genetics, our, our expectation a priori is that there should be more positive selection in, in the larger and more stable population, which is exactly what we're seeing here. Um, I try to avoid the sort of go term storytelling, but I'll just mention a few things that are sort of interesting. Um, multiple genes were identified involved in heavy metal metabolism, um, likely important for adherence to the, the um, stomach mucosa. Uh, and in European populations only, we see antibiotic resistance genes particularly MRCA, um, likely because these are the only populations that really saw antibiotics in the recent history, or in any history for that matter. Okay, so I would say these results are interesting in the following ways. One, because this population is very old in the African population. And two, as I mentioned at the start, despite the fact that it has an extremely high prevalence in Africa, there's essentially no gastric pathology associated with it. So it's there, but it's not doing bad things to its host. Um, for those of you who think about uh, viruses, at least, um, this might not be a huge surprise and really suggests a model that's potentially appealing that we're looking at more thoroughly now, which is this long association between um, Helicobacter and humans in Africa has actually been accompanied by selection for reduced pathogenicity. And where the strong bottleneck out of Africa, where the population size is reduced, selective pressures are lessened, um, has actually freed Helicobacter from this sort of constraint and it's now more pathogenic outside of Africa um, than in its original, um, where it originated. Okay, I'm going to end the Helicobacter story on another thing that we're looking at now, which is completely different, but I think you'll find related. So this is a paper from a couple of years ago that we worked on with Anna and Alex Penis. And this is in humans, and this is just a structure plot, okay? So hand population, chemo uh, population, so Native American, um, Polynesians, etc. Okay. You see something that looks normal for human structure. These two individuals are two ancient DNA samples sampled from uh, a tribe that's, um, as far as we know, extinct in South America now, the Bodokudo. Okay. These samples are pre-European contact. All right. And what you see when you sequence the ancient DNA from these guys is that they look like modern Polynesians. So just to say that again, because it's amazing, and not that many of you look amazed, so I'm going to try again. <laughs> if you take ancient South Americans and sequence them, they look like modern Polynesians. At least these two. A few of you are faking surprise. Thank you. I'll move on. Then. So this is pretty amazing to me, right? People that are old from here look like people that are modern from here. Um, this hypothesis has actually been around for a while. Does anyone? Recognize this quote, Gontiki, thank you. So there was an anthropologist in the mid 20th century, Thor Heyerdahl, 
who also had this idea based on cultural information. He thought that there was a lot of similarities um, culturally between Polynesian, indigenous Polynesian groups and indigenous South American groups and proposed that there could have been an oceanic route of colonization of the Americas potentially. People thought he was a loon. A lot of people still think he's a loon, but um, in a move that was not particularly uncrazy, right? This is still sort of a crazy thing to do. He built a balsa wood raft and showed that you could float across in around 100 days and, and survive. So um, a sort of experimental anthropological evidence for migration. But ancient DNA is looking pretty interesting for this idea now. And the point of all of this is that um, based on the fact that species like Helicobacter really well recapitulate human history, for things like this that are very controversial, I would say that Helicobacter is actually a really interesting avenue to pursue. And we're starting to get samples now from indigenous populations of sort of the Polynesian islands and South America um, to try and ask if this is a better way of looking at this question uh, of whether there should, oops, of whether we should be adding this arrow here in this sort of map of human migration. Okay, helicobacter questions briefly before we move on to our next story. What year did those two individuals pass? They date to something between 900 AD and 1100 AD. The question was, I'm sorry, was what, um, how old are these two individuals? Probably between 900 and 1100 AD. Certainly before we have very strong evidence of European contact. The reason that's important is because there's a well-known Polynesian slave trade into South America beginning around the 1450s, right? So Europeans started capturing Polynesian Islanders, bringing them to South America to work plantations. So if these guys dated from then, that would not be at all surprising. So the dating here is actually sort of the key finding of the whole thing, which is why, um, you know, the dating is probably pretty good, but I wouldn't inhale completely deeply on that, of course, until we have other lines of evidence. I, I, I'm still putting a question mark here. This is a suggestive result, but, but nothing more at this time. John? Where are they from West Greece? <laughs> well, so Thor went the other way. Yeah. Um, I do have it going that way. That's true, because that's in principle what this observation is, right? We have people who look like they're from here, who are sampled here. Um, you note astutely that Thor actually went this way and hit the Polynesian Islands. Um, yep, that's the way I had the arrow because that's sort of the result, but in principle that could be bi-directional at least. Or that was just, you know, a hundred day vacation round trip for Polynesian Islanders in the 800s. Head over to Brazil for a few weeks and then come back. Yep. Okay, let's move on to our next story. Sorry, I'm forgetting to repeat the questions. Yeah. I'm supposed to repeat the questions for the microphone. I always forget that. Okay, um, our next story then is going to be human cytomegalovirus, another thing that lives in humans, this time a virus, um, HCMB for brevity from here on out. Uh, just a few fun facts about CMB. So cytomegaloviruses exist essentially in all primates where we've looked, from humans to green monkeys. But CMBs are strongly species specific. So chimp CMB, what we call CCMB for obvious reasons, and human CMB, HCMB, cannot cross this barrier as far as anyone can tell or anyone's ever observed. So they're really specialists. It's a herpes virus. Like Helicobacter, um, at least half of the global population has it. Um, almost certainly that's an underestimate. It's a DNA virus. It's about 235 KB, the genome. We've estimated 200 open reading frames. Um, that's a very conservative estimate. Um, primary infection usually occurs via mucosal surfaces, so if you're not born with it, as I'll address in a moment, you go to daycare or your first day of school and kids are spitting on you and peeing on you and then you have their CMB. It transfers very easily with really any bodily fluid. Um, yeah, and once it's in the body, it, it remains uh, throughout life and can be reactivated. So all the results I'm going to show you are from the last really five years of work by an excellent uh, postdoc in the lab, Nick Renzetti. Okay, so why as a population genesis am I excited about CMB? Well, this is one very good reason. So I'm going to focus mainly on congenital infections, that is infections in utero. Um, because this is a virus that actually can cross the placenta and invade tissues throughout the fetus, and in fact, CMB is actually the leading cause of infection-related birth defects in the world, as far as we know. 
So what happens is you have your population of mom here circulating in her blood, in plasma. Um, it crosses the placenta, infects the fetus, and does something very specific, which is it compartmentalizes. So there's multiple compartments here. I'm showing you here a sort of uh, plasma compartment and a kidney compartment. The samples that we actually have information from are usually the kidney compartment because we can sample urine, uh, the salivary gland compartment because we can sample saliva, and the plasma compartment because we can sample blood. There's many, many compartments. We don't really even know how many. There's certainly a brain compartment and a heart compartment, but um, for some reason, those are harder samples to get from newborns. So these are the three things that we get. Okay, so I'm going to extend this analogy a little bit that I started off with and say that the demographic history of HGMV within one person is not terribly unlike the demographic of history of humans around the world. By which I mean, there's a large ancestral population, in this case mom, in this case Africa. Okay? Uh, there's a population size change associated with colonization. So just like all humans don't get up and leave Africa at one time, um, all uh, viral population from mom doesn't get up and colonize the fetus at one time. It's some subsample of those. Um, there's subsequent colonization, either throughout the new world or in the compartments of the fetus. Colonized populations may subsequently adapt to their new habitat, which is what I'm going to tell you a lot about now. There are very specific pressures, whether you're living in northern Sweden or Central America, just as there are very different pressures living in the kidney uh, versus the salivary gland compartment, if you're HCMD. And there's migrants exchanged between these populations. So they're not randomly mating, just as with humans, but there is some migration via plasma. Okay, so this analogy falls apart if you push too hard, but in general terms, this is sort of uh, an intuitive way to think about uh, infection of a virus in a new host. So I'll tell you uh, one simple result first and show you something more interesting, which is if you look at different patient samples, so each of these uh, columns is a patient, and this is sampled from saliva, from urine, from plasma, you already see that there's some very compartment-specific effects, by which I mean if you sample um, viral population from plasma in different individuals, they group together very strongly. That is, there seems to be a plasma-specific environmental effect, just like you know, there's a salivary gland-specific effect, whereas the urine seems to um, be a sort of filter for all compartments, which is not a big surprise. So you observe many different types of things in urine, but other compartments tend to be quite specific. Um, because of this, and I'll explain the reasons why we think this is true in a moment, there's very different levels of diversity within one patient for different compartments. So this is just nucleotide diversity for a urine population and a plasma population in a patient. What's more exciting is the following. So this is FST. This is a measure of differentiation between populations. Okay? This is one individual, B101, just sampled at two different time points, and you see through time it's diverging a little bit. It's fixing mutations as you would expect, but nothing too different. What's really interesting is if you look on this side, so this is one patient, this a newborn, B103, sampled essentially at birth, one week, and sampled from two locations, the urine and the plasma. So the CMV population living in blood, the CMV population living in kidney. And what you see is that even by birth, those two populations are very, very differentiated. And FST nearly 0.5, okay? So very, very different from one another within one kid. Um, as different, I should say, is if you sample those, those two compartments from completely unrelated individuals, okay? So plasma in the kidney, um, compartment between me and you is as different as within myself between um, plasma and kidney. Okay? That's kind of, kind of wacky, I think. Um, with this kind of data and following on my analogy with human colonization of the world, you can use population genetics to try and estimate the demographic history of this infection. Okay? And what we see when we do this is the following. So you have your ancestral population here, which is mom's viral population in the plasma, which is what crosses the placenta. We estimate this colonization bottleneck here, um, which is around four months uh, in utero. There's a second bottleneck that you see in the urine compartment, uh, in the kidney compartment, um, around five and a half months. And then you can estimate rates of gene flow between these two. You can estimate population growth, population size, all the same tricks we do in human, Drosophila, et cetera, we're doing here. 
What's sort of unique about this is virologists haven't really been able to piece this together using their tool set. So this is really the first clinically relevant insight into the timing of fetal infection, when it has even occurred during pregnancy, conditional on the fact that we've known for a long time that kids are already born with it, that it's crossing the placenta sometime. Now we have a very good idea when those times are and how much gene flow there is between these compartments. This is another way of looking at that selection result, which I find interesting. So this is just a normal looking tree where these are two patients, B103, M103, and you see their plasma groups together, whereas different patients here, their urine all groups together. That's another way of saying that the urine environment is very, very specific. It's so specific, in fact, that on a sequence level, right, on a nucleotide level, the sequence is more similar between two urine compartments from two random individuals than between urine and plasma in one individual. Right? That's weird. Yeah? That's like saying that if I sample a high altitude human in the Himalayas and the Andes, they're more closely related across their whole genome on their nucleotide level. Right? That's that's not true, by the way. I'm, <laughs> I'm distinctly <laughs> not saying that. But but this observation is similar to that, right? The selective pressure of this environment is so strong that it drives these unrelated populations to be so similar on a sequence level. Uh, so I would say a compelling, suggestive example of very, very strong parallel adaptation per host for each human these guys are infecting. Jack, yes? Do you know if you can get across the whole genome to very diverse setup, a lot of our population trials going in, they resolve it, yes, with the new protein. So you know if the variation are having any hot spots so you can actually detect where these are yeah. located and are they in some moment in that you can say that that's a real hot spot for the yeah. population that's the real trans. So the question is whether or not the variation is distributed uniformly or non-uniformly across the genome, and it is distinctly not uniformly distributed. So we have a nice figure that I don't include here where we just plot the genome and plot the level of divergence and, and variation, and it's uh, there are definite hot spots of, of divergence, and uh, well, there's certainly mutation rate variation also, but once you account for that, there's very clear, clear hot spots. Um, because we don't have a ton of information functionally about what these open reading frames are doing, we can say that these are clustering to certain places, but we just don't have a, a very strong functional leg to stand on in terms of what those places are actually doing. Yeah. I was thinking of seeing if you have some of the proteins that are known from the electron microscopy to be in the, the lipid bilayers, those ones that would be much more in contact with the Yeah. I was thinking more of a biochemical yeah. oriented annotation. All right. That would be an extremely helpful direction to go at this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we know for sure that there is a single origin for the contents of the, the one sample that is urine and the kidney? Because if these were two independent yeah. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting question. The thing that we do know is that they were infected from mom, right? Because that's the only contact they've had when we sampled them at birth. What we don't know, which I think is probably more to the point of your question, is whether mom is passing, you know, populations from her plasma and her urine and her kidney, and then those are sort of sorting themselves out in, in fetus, right? That's possible. Um, the reason that we don't think that's probably true is there's actually even a placenta-specific population. And so this it really looks like this population, with each step it's taking, it's having to really adapt to that compartment and then move on to the next one. And so there's a placental population also uh, in the handful of cases where we actually can get our hands on that sample uh, that looks very different from other compartments too. So I think since that is the route of infection and that population is already pretty differentiated from the other compartments, um, that's probably not what's going on. Um, probably they are uniquely um, moving across the fitness landscape, as it were, once they enter a new host. Yeah. Um, right, so everything that we've looked at so far and that I've shown you has been congenital infections. Um, I think we've had some important insights here. There really is no good drug treatment for CMV, um, but there are some experimental drugs that we're starting to look at now in a framework not unlike what I'm about to tell you about in influenza. Um, with the real goal being to at least prevent that initial um, infection size that passes from mom. We don't have a good way to stop it, but um, we think we have some promising ways to at least reduce the size of the population during the initial infection. And, and we're also trying to collect samples now from, from cohorts at daycares where there's horizontal infection. So when they're not born with it, but when they get it at daycare, 
and start asking about selection and demographic um, sort of trajectories and histories when infection is horizontal rather than vertical. Okay, any questions on CMV other than what we've we've had? Yeah, sure. Yeah, just wondering what's so what proportion of the genome would be under selection in these different compartments? Yeah. That's a tough yeah, question, I mean, right? It, it suggests a lot of it. Yeah, it suggests a, an amount of selection that makes me uncomfortable as a general neutralist. <laughs> yeah. Very many locations with yeah. uh, polarization. That's right. It's not just changing an open reading frame or two, right? It suggests that it's almost genome wide. I mean, that's. I mean, it's weird. I, I, it, I don't like it either, but I just don't have another <laughs> great explanation for this observation right now. When you just when you build a tree and all urine compartments group together and they're just more closely related on the sequence level, no matter which patients from where in the world you pull. Uh, I, don't, I don't have an awesome, better explanation than lots of strong positive selection for that right now. That's not Because these virus also stay in the And they have as large as there is in their genome. And that's from the old virus from the 80s and 70s. And the things that nobody reads because it's not um, is the, the early gene expression, the intermediate gene expression, the A gene expression, which are also stratified depending on where the virus is in, for example, in the epidermis or in, in different tissue. Mm -hmm. and, and they are programmed to be expressed in certain strata during the process and the production of the, of the virus. And that's one thing where you can see there is a synchronization with the type of gene. Yeah. Where they are I mean, it'd be nice to get it in a model where it could ask these sorts of questions, right? These are essentially all natural population samples right now. We don't have this in a cell culture like we do in influenza, where it could, where it could ask that question a little more specifically. Yeah. You, could, you could actually set up a system where you could look at this in a, or a dish, yeah. much more controlled stuff. I know you guys love genetics. I mean, people are using primate models for this, actually, which is just not work I'm comfortable doing, actually, so we don't do that, but people are doing that. Yeah. yeah. Roman? So, I understand that cross plus convergence is going to be between population from the same individual. Yeah. Then, then you can also ask the same thing about cross plus convergence between individuals or among the different departments. So, if you were looking at the between individuals, uh, comparison. Mm -hmm. What is the portion of overlap? But for which compartment? Uh, well, I guess it could be, um, it could be uh, compartments of the same compartments. If you had cross lots of divergence, are they often overlapping between individuals? Um, as they, are those cross lots overlapping between compartments? So you're asking maybe there's a handful of regions that have to change for each compartment? Like maybe there's 20 regions that are uh, involved in compartment-specific uh, adaptation. Yeah. 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 I mean, young, yeah. I mean, all I can say is our changes are um, there are hot spots of divergence, but these changes are occurring largely genome-wide for these compartments. Like there aren't a small handful of regions that we see changing for a urine compartment versus a kidney compartment. Which would be reassuring if we did see that, but we just were not. Yeah. John? Maybe it's a related question. I know it's possible to virus like this, but are you finding the virtues at non synonymous versus synonymous sites? Or yeah. across the board, it's just non synonymous sites? Uh, no. So the question is whether there's difference divergence in synonymous versus non synonymous sites. Um, so divergence at non synonymous sites is about four times higher than divergence at synonymous sites genome wide. So this virus is just cranking along. Yeah. That comes to the part of this. And there is a, all these viruses you can see in the UI in what's called a leaky scanning. So that means they have a problem with COSAC transensive sequence. Which means that they will actually preferentially insert a third nucleotide at random. That's, that's the old biology of sequence. So you might want to, I don't know whether you've looked. This that's new, that's news to me, actually. Yeah. This is yep. 40 years ago. It's actually yeah. collectors, professor at the University of GE, who works on these leaky scanners. Hmm. Might be one that wouldn't explain parallel fixation. 
potentially yeah, 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 yeah. But we actually were looking at the prevalence of trying to attack frequencies yeah, yeah, yeah. using the Cossack consensus, which is more of a good stuff. One more, then we'll do influenza. Yeah, yeah. One more thing. How do you get the quote working patterns between the the ones that are kind of adapted to the same thing? Because if the signal is skewed wide, the genomic like wide, mm -hmm. the maybe that there are many genes that are quote working with this one is not. Yeah. So pathway was the question, whether or not there's specific pathways being hit. We just don't have great information on that, right? I mean, this isn't. Uh, you know, we don't have the information like we have in Persopho to ask these sorts of questions. We have a bunch of predicted open reading frames and a small handful of coding changes that we understand functionally what they're doing, but we don't have the great functional information that we have in other organisms to ask on a pathway level. At the nucleotide level, we can see that, right? And naturally, the, the fundamental observation that on the nucleotide level, they're becoming more similar between compartments. So it looks like many nucleotide changes have to happen to be a population living in a kidney compartment. Yeah. Okay. Let's do our final story. Influenza. We're doing okay. Yeah, we're doing okay. Okay. So this is, I imagine, the one of the three that um, you're most familiar with. So it's a human pathogen. Um, it's an eight-segment RNA virus. So it, it does not recombine. So HCMV recombines very heavily. Um, influenza does not, but it reassorts. So. It doesn't recombine within a segment, but it can move these segments around, okay, in a way that looks to be under fairly strong selection, actually. Um, the most common treatments are neuraminidase inhibitors, uh, most commonly oseltamivir, which is also known as Tamiflu, which is what I'll talk about largely today. Um, but resistance has been um, observed in natural populations to evolve very quickly. Uh, and the work that I'll show has come from these handful of papers over the last couple of years, and it's been worked on by a number of members in the group. Okay, so here we're taking an experimental evolution approach, so it'll be different from what I've been telling you. This is not a natural population sample, but these are passaged. So uh, the experiment just briefly looks like this. So they're passaged in MDCK cells. So this is passage one, passage two, passage three. At each passage, we take um, whole genome uh, population level sequencing. So we have 13 time points because we have 13 passages. So at each of these time points, we have whole population, whole genome sequencing. And the experiment is split at passage four, where we have one population that's maintained uh, as a control with no Tamiflu treatment, uh, and one population that's maintained with Tamiflu treatment. And this is done in duplicate. Okay. So just one word on inference here, as this is something that we think a lot about, but I'm only showing on one slide today. So fundamentally, if you think about making inference from time sample data, that is polymorphism data taken at multiple time points, this is the information you have. You have, uh, this is frequency and this is time, so you have some frequency at time one, and some frequency at time two, and some frequency at time three, right? You have that first sight. That's fundamentally what you're trying to draw inference from. The idea here that we um, proposed, which I think seems to work pretty well, is to use this distribution of this variance in allele trajectories across the whole genome, so at every polymorphic site through your time sample, <coughs> to get a null distribution of this FS prime statistic, which just captures that. And if you remember introductory population genetics, um, this uh, expected variance through time is really a measure of effective population size. Right? And thus, if you have a measure of effective population size, that essentially tells you how much genetic drift or how much variance you would expect through time if the mutation was completely neutral. Okay, so we use every site in the genome to construct this null distribution, and then we can look for site-specific outliers, that is, are there sites where their change in allele frequency is too fast to be consi um, consistent with genetic drift, too fast to be consistent with being a purely neutral mutation. Okay, and we implement this in, a, in an approximate Bayesian framework, which we call WFABC, right, Fisher ABC. Okay, so you do that, and this is just a, a basic way of summarizing the results. So this is across the whole genome here. Each dot is uh, an observed polymorphism above some cutoff frequency, and the red line is statistical significance. So you see that the great majority of things in this particular replicate of this experiment 
um, but this is true across all of them, are completely consistent with genetic drift. That is, their change in allele frequency through time um, fits very well with our expectation of neutrality. But you have a small handful of mutations that are changing too fast to be consistent with that expectation. Uh, and those mutations tend to cluster in, in HA and NA, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. As I told you, Tamiflu, also Tamivir, is a neuraminidase inhibitor, so we actually understand a fair amount about these mutations that I'll show you in a moment. Um, this is showing you the trajectories of those identified mutations. So this is um, a comically small legend uh, figure. Um, <laughs> this is frequency, and this is time across our passages. And I'm just showing you our mutations. So these are the actual mutational frequencies that were significant using this ABC approach. Okay, and replicate one with drug and replicate two with drug. There is one overlap between the two. It's this H274Y, which is a very well-known uh, Tamiflu-resistant mutation from nature. So that's a sort of nice sanity check that we re-identify the thing that we know does the job. But we also identify a number of other interesting possible mutations, particularly in neuraminidase, that seem to have the same uh, phenotypic effect. So as population geneticists, we like to ask questions about the DFE. And I think this is one really nice way sort of visualizing the larger scope of this experiment. So here I'm showing you the distribution of fitness effects of beneficial mutations only. So the beneficial tail of the DFE, that is the selective effect of each observed mutation, okay, inferred in our genome. And what you see is in the control, so when there's no drug treatment, so zero here is neutral, it's wild type like, you see a very condensed distribution, okay, where you have many things uh, the things that look beneficial are very close to neutrality. That is, they're only very weakly beneficial. In the presence of drug, you see a distribution that looks largely the same, but you get this heavy tail. Okay, so you have mutations that are a 10%, 20 even 30% fence advantage. These are obviously resistance mutations. Okay, these are the mutations that we identified using our approach. I've just overlaid some distributions here for any um, Fisher's geometric model aficionados in the audience who read a lot of Alan Orr. Uh, distributions that people have proposed to capture these sorts of distributions. But fundamentally, what you see is a so-called heavy tail distribution. That is, when you stress your population, when you bring it further from optimum, you get this heavy tail of beneficial mutations popping up to deal with this challenge. This has been seen in yeast and pseudomonas and many other organisms, and it's very clear in our data set as well. Okay, so what's the fundamental story there? So also Tamavir resistance spreads quickly because it's only one or maybe two mutational steps away. Okay? This is why global populations have a pretty easy time dealing with Tamiflu. So I just want to tell you a few results from something that's in review now, which we think looks really cool, which is looking at an alternative drug treatment um, called favipiravir. It has a completely different mechanism with action. So it interacts with the viral RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And what it does in practice is it turns up the mutation rate in the virus population by a lot. Um, at least by an order of magnitude, and more depending on how much papillopiravir you give it, as I'll show you in a moment. Um, again, that's obviously a very different mechanism from how oseltamivir is working. This is not approved on patients, so Japan has started stockpiling last year papillopiravir. Um, and I'm going to take the exact same um, experimental setup I showed you and statistical analysis I showed you and just repeat it except for papillopiravir. Okay, so that's what I'm going to show. I won't re-explain all the experimental design because they're the same. Okay, here's one result. So, this is sort of a complicated figure, but it has a lot of information. So this is through time, okay, this is our passages. This light-colored line is drug concentration, okay? So drug concentration, we're changing, we're modulating throughout the experiment. And these are essentially uh, growth rate of the viral population. So what we see is as we start increasing drug concentration, our population starts declining. If we remove drug at this time, the population recovers. Okay, so we turn up mutation rate for a while, we get rid of drug, mutation rate goes back to normal, and the population can recover. It can start purging all these mutations that have been introduced effectively. So that's a withdrawal experiment. A constant experiment, we increase drug concentration to a certain point, this is actually a relatively low concentration. And then we just keep it uniform for the rest of the experiment. This is an interesting replicate because you see, like we see here, the population is declining as you're turning up drug, but there are some resistance mutations arising and some replicates, 
when you keep the concentration low, that lets the population size start recovering. So the population can repair its polymerase to some extent um, as long as you keep um, concentration very low. So this is actually the first evidence that a population even can adapt to favipiravir treatment. This will be bad news for some people with drug company ties in the world, but we see it very clearly. We see it in two replicates. Um, there is some adaptation to this treatment. There's a lot of ways to show the big result, but I just chose the simplest, which is as you turn up, um, concentration, the population crashes. So I was showing you on the slide before quite low concentrations, but you can see for populations raised at different drug concentrations, there's a really pretty good relationship. And once you're above around 160, the population just crashes. It's just overwhelmed by this input of deleterious mutations, as I'll explain in a second, and the population simply can't recover. And, and all um, uh, experimental populations that we've looked at, anything over 160 dies and goes extinct. Okay, well, that's pretty good news in principle. If you want to think about treating influenza virus with new um, therapeutics, um, but this is really just an observation that I've shown you, which is the population seems to crash when you add a lot of drugs. So I just wanted to end on what we think are the actual evolutionary mechanisms that are going on here to give you hopefully some insight on, on what's actually happening in these populations. So there's this term in the literature, um, mutational meltdown, and this refers to the accumulation of deleterious mutations, um, usually in small populations, which leads to a subsequent decrease in fitness and population size, which then allows more deleterious mutations to fix because the population size is getting small, which then reduces population size more. And this is a sort of meltdown that this snowballs on you until you eventually hit extinction. Um, mutational meltdown is really an effect, right? It's an effect of these things happening. And those things happening is driven by two processes, which I'll just briefly summarize here, Hill-Robertson interference and Muller's ratchet. So Hill-Robertson interference uh, is really quite simply on non-recombining chromosomes or segments in our case, the efficacy of selection is reduced. So beneficial mutations have a lower probability of fixing because they're linked to deleterious mutations and they can't recombine off of the same haplotype. The population can't get rid of deleterious mutations as efficiently because they may be linked to beneficial mutations. Okay, so all of these things are essentially just interfering with one another, just like it sounds. So the population is just um, less able to keep good things, less able to get rid of bad things. Uh, and in this way, the population has an increased load of deleterious mutations over time and a decreased rate of beneficial fixation. Um, so as we turn up mutation rate in favipiravir, right, what we're really doing is just throwing in more of these mutations. The great majority of them are going to be deleterious rather than beneficial, just because that's the shape of the distribution of fitness effects, right? Most mutations are bad rather than good. And so you have more and more interference and you just can't keep your good things and you can no longer get rid of your bad things. That's essentially what's happening here. Um, the other concept which is important is Muller's ratchet. Um, so this is an idea that uh, under models of mutation and drift, your most fit segment or individual, if you want to think of a totally non-recombining, non-reassorting genome, can be lost. And so what I'm showing you here is uh, mutational classes. So you can think of these as segments with zero deleterious mutations, one deleterious mutation, two deleterious, three deleterious mutations. Okay. And the arrows indicate that selection is preferring, obviously, these classes that have very few um, deleterious mutations on them. Right. And selection is trying to get rid of these that have many deleterious mutations on them. Okay. So that's one process going on. But mutation is always pushing you to the left, right? So it's always pushing you off of your least loaded class, off of your best class. And then the idea is um, by mutation and drift, you'll periodically lose your best class. That is, there will no longer be a zero class in your population. And now your most fit individuals have one deleterious mutation rather than zero. And this is called the click of the ratchet. And a ratchet is the analogy because you can only turn it one direction, right? There's no going back once you've lost it. So with each click of this ratchet here, our population is getting less and less fit. And so fitness decreases, population size decreases. And because of that, the ratchet starts clicking faster. And this is another mechanism. So again, in favipiravir, what we're doing is turning up mutation rate. And so we're pushing these classes left faster than they were used to being pushed. Okay. So just to summarize that little line of argument briefly, in the presence of high concentrations of favipiravir, we observed increase, um, increasing rates of mutation and deleterious segregation. 
Um, we see decreasing effective population sizes, which we can experimentally measure, and population fitness, and eventually extinction in all of our replicates. And this is really, as I've argued, um, Hill-Roberts interference um, plus molar ratchet is equally mutational meltdown in this case. Okay, so just a general overall summary. So I guess maybe one unifying theme is that whole genome time sample data is really changing a lot the kind of population genetics that we can do in these critters. Um, Helicobacter, uh, well, I guess the main take home there is that the demographic history of Helicobacter might actually be really interesting for thinking about questions of the demographic history of humans that we haven't been able to satisfactorily address thus far. Um, HCMB, in terms of population genetics, is one of the best systems I know for studying models of subdivision with selection and migration, something that theoreticians like a lot, and this is actually a really good uh, empirical example of that. And population genetics is giving us really unique clinical insights as well at the moment. And in influenza, this sort of framework we've developed um, jointly, experimentally, and statistically is really giving us pretty good insight on the fitness landscape of drug resistance. And it's a really high throughput framework for testing additional drugs like favipiravir, um, which are starting to look extremely promising. Um, with that, this thing funding. So statistical and theoretical development is funded by the FNS and the ERC. And uh, the virus work is funded by the Department of Defense and the Department of the Army. <laughs> and Army fan in the back? <laughs> and uh, uh, our lab is currently three um, PhD students and seven postdocs. I mainly pointed out to people along the way, but uh, Valeria has really led the helicobacter work, Nick the CMB work, and two former members, Claudia Bank and Matthew Full, uh, led the influenza analyses that I showed today. And with that, I'll just end on, on a brief advertisement. Uh, as Diana said, in 2017, the lab's moving to, to ASU, to the Center for Evolution and Medicine. Um, there's more information on our website if you like. If you have interests at all overlapping with mine, um, and like I showed today, the center is actually going to be a really unique and exciting place in terms of combining uh, theoretical population geneticists with virologists and anthropologists, um, all united by this sort of common interest. And Arizona is where I grew up, and it's actually a really pretty place if you've not been. And if nothing else, it's 28 degrees there today. So that's, that's pretty good. Um, okay, I'll take any additional questions.